three phases of 120 degree AC be combined in series to yield the sum of their input voltages. Of course, logic will tell us they can't. But here we're going to look at some things whereby we can perhaps actually do this. I've tested it. It works on a lower scale. Some difficulties were arrived at. We tried to place it on the larger scale. Problems for that were found. Now we're going to go down over here and look at what we're looking at. We got the 666 coil system running. Back out here or here. That's the three coil system. Running unloaded with no field. As I noted, it's running with no field. And we got a pretty balanced performance up here. Showing that all the amperages on the phases, from left to right on the bottom, are somewhat balanced near a third of an amp. And the stator line delivery lines are also somewhat balanced, between 52 and 55 on the in input lines. Now if you apply the law of cosines to that, you'll find probably a 120 degree angle. And now what we've got, we've got a scoping. We have a scoping of an incorrect scoping. There's the color coding of the system. We have a silver dollar on top. One secondary on the top, we have a silver dollar on the bottom to indicate the other secondary. Now we have it on dual channel and it's given us that signal. That signal, you might see a little time a difference um, on the scoping versus the camera. That signal appears to be roughly 120 degrees out of phase. When we got these things over there, we got the top one reversed. To actually show the correct timing between the top and the bottom of the stack of these coils, we have to make sure that the coils, the sensor coils that we're going to use as secondaries, uh, are in the uh, same correct polarity of testing. What this boils down to, a north pole issuing through the bottom of the sensor coil is the same thing as a south pole issuing through the top of the sensor coil. And since we got the sensor coils on opposite sides of the stack, the actual correct reading will look like this. We'll go ahead and turn that coil over. We'll back out some so we can see. I'm actually turning that sensor coil over. Now there's the true position of the sensor coil recording the true difference in time of the signals between two of them sensor coils in space on the top and the bottom of the stack with phase three on top and phase two on the bottom. Now in order to unify voltages separated out of time so that they can all add sequentially to the sum of the input voltages verify that remarkable claim, which we seem to have verified by special means. Today we're just going to show the first hurdle that's crossed. We've got to cross another hurdle to be able to demonstrate that full effect. So we can see there, there's that. Now what we're going to do, we can see 
but there's a phase angle separation there. It's pretty small. It's probably 60 degrees out of phase on those two correct measurements. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take that top sensor. I'm going to show this also. And we're going to move that sensor over to the top of phase one. This is shown on the checkerboard scheme right there. We're going to move that sensor over there. We're going to let the camera record that. Now we're going to look at that phase relationship. As you will see, now we got something that appears to be almost completely opposite. If we had three phase inputs, how could that be? Now we're going to do one more thing. We're going to go in there and we're going to show that too. We're going to turn that top sensor coil over. Which is, when we do this, that is simply a wiring option that we can take in order to combine all three phases out of time, in time, with no loss. And now we're going to look at the new relationship. Now we see that they are almost completely in phase. If we could do this one more time, we're going around the circle. Mr. Kittle's trying to get into my action again. Out, Kittle. If we could do this one more time and do that three times around the circle, we could obtain a voltage that is the addition of all of our stator voltages. But we've demonstrated now that we're able, out, cat, that we're able to do this. Now how and why are we able to do that? Okay, we're going to go over here and look. First of all, we're going to look again, show our balanced up inputs and outputs. It's hard to see through the camera screen, but I can see we got 55, 52, and 52 stator amps going in, and all of our phase amps are pretty well closely matched. 311, 318, 328, up and down. Now we're going to go over here and look at the relative voltage distribution. This becomes extremely important. Let's see why in a second. What we've got to be able to do is include the bottom three meters, which are the interphasal voltage readings in a coordination with the resonant voltage rises. Of course, we're going to note the resonant voltage rises for each situation. We have 0.8 volts becoming 8.2 volts on phase one. We have 0.9 volts becoming 7.9 volts on phase two, smallest of the voltage rises. And then on phase three, which we're not going to bother with when we look at the three meter reading, setting upwards, we have 0.8 volts becoming 8.2 volts on 3VI. Now at the bottom, we have the relative voltage measurements. So we'll get back into the screen here and look at our relative voltage measurements between the resonant rises of voltages and the resonant rises of voltages themselves. We've had to use that small red voltage meter for phase one because of lack of meters. We would prefer to have a larger meter. We'll have to weigh it with what we got. So we should be able to see here now, we got 8.2 volts on phase one's resonant rise. We got 7.9 volts next to it on 2VI. 
and we've got 8.2 volts on 3VI. These voltages are also fairly equal in resonant rise. Now down at the bottom then, we have, we're measuring the separation of those voltages in time. And we're still going to have a little problem here to try to contain all this information. Looks like that might do it. Hopefully that will do it. Should be able to see 2.63 volts on 1-3 and 13 some volts, 13.9 volts on 1-2 and 13.3 volts on 2-3. Now what we've done earlier is plotted out these actual vectors on a sheet of paper and we see that on 1-2 in the center, we had 13.9 volts between volts between them on 1-2. We plot that out, we see that that's about 120 degree phase angle. And likewise for the second one going around the circle, we got a 7.9 and 8.2 volts with 13.3 volts between them. And so when we go around the circle, we arrive graphically at something like this. We've now plotted the three vectors out. we established the angle by of each of the differences between phase one and two and two and three by that voltage rating which is larger than the sum of the component than the component voltages themselves. We draw a triangle out based on that reading. That's called the law of cosines to determine all three lengths. Now we plot it one, two, and three. Let me get in there and point that. We plot it out one here, two there, and three there. That's just good and fine. Looks pretty much like three phase. However, we come to a problem now. We measure the voltage on 1 3. It's only 2.6 volts between the 8 volts, 8.2 volts on 1 and the 8.2 volts on 3. Those are now identical, I suppose. Well, there's only two sum volts between there. So the laws of vector addition demand that we decrease the distance between those two vectors. We want to use the law of cosines to, inter to, to determine this interfacial angle now we got the extra two answers here. We got that answer, we got that answer. And we got this whole chunk of missing time. Yes, we have a whole chunk of missing time. So what we're going to do is fold that diagram, take the 2D vectors and allow them to become 3D vectors and the voltage measurement between those vectors will now lie across a curved 2D surface or what we have here as a proof that the machine is exhibiting space-time distortion and that in fact when we do this thing it shows us the results that we're going to get. So we go in there 
Now I'm going to cut out that missing portion of time. And that, by folding it, Now that we've moved the vector one, over, and taken up a piece of missing time, we now only have 240 degrees in the whole time circle. And we've adjusted the vectors to look like in three dimensions what the actual vector change will be after it goes through this process. And so we can see then, not real good probably from this viewpoint. Let's try to get the camera out here in a little bit of better light. I can do for now. So we see there, even from this viewpoint, we can see that now vectors 2 going downward, vector 2, 1 going upward, it's appearing almost 180 degrees out of phase. That would imply that somewhere among 12 magnetic fields, uh, 6 magnetic fields, we can also make a measurement and turn that measurement around. And everything would be almost completely in phase as we have done here. Now, like I've said, we only need to complete the third segment. We have to match a third segment that's almost in time with these two segments and then we can sequentially add the voltages together and it's acting as if there was no time separation. And since we then have gone on long enough, we'll call that quick.